Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Denver Nuggets podcast that appreciates Aaron Gordon almost as much as members of his immediate family. Welcome to the Dionivier Nuggets' Serbian Corner. My name is Miroslav Cuk, and if there was one thing I did this week that was worth mentioning, it was going to the Star Karina in Belgrade and watching Serbia play Puerto Rico in the only World Cup prep game that the national team played in front of the home crowd. Serbia won by 40. It was plus 40 at the halftime, actually. So it was a snoozer for casual fans. But the one thing that actually impressed me is the fact that Serbia looks finally prepared to play some smaller lineups with quicker guys out there, being able to switch one through four in their start starting lineup and even one through five in certain situations. Take this with a grain of salt since Puerto Rico had a tough flight to Serbia and doesn't have any real big men. If I wasn't impressed enough last year when uh, Aaron Gordon traveled to Prague just to be able to watch Nikola Jokic play at the Eurobasket uh, for Team Serbia, I am now delighted for him to be just the second Nuggets teammate to be documented visiting Sombor, Serbia. We don't know how many days he spent in Sombor. Heck, he might still be there. But we know he was there for the racing day at the Sombor Hippodrome. I won't bother you with the exact results of the races, that's why you follow Harrison Wind on X, but the apparent friendship and mutual respect between the Nuggets' all-time great players is what warms my heart. Now I can only hope for Nicola to return the visit and go surfing with Aaron in California. But before all that happened, when we didn't know Aaron is willing to meet with Nicola on the other side of the globe, Exactly one year ago, the DNVR Nuggets crew landed in Belgrade. Seven people, led by the unstoppable decidedness of Adam Mares, traveled many miles to be able to spend a week with their fans and learn about Serbia on site. No need for me to go deep about this. Go watch the 100 Invisible Threads docu on YouTube about it. But I wanted to revisit one moment that happened on that first day in Belgrade. Adam was still figuring out what he, what the hell he's going to do while in Serbia so the trip would be fruitful when he asked one question to all the Serbs that were sitting at the table at the coffee place at the Sava Lake in Belgrade. He asked everybody to rate every Nuggets player 1 to 10 in terms of how much they liked the guys as players and as people. One guy stood out. Aaron Gordon got a 10 from everybody. Not Jamal, not MPJ. It was Aaron that everybody trusted completely. Now, I wanted to go deeper on this subject today, so I called the guest who is a Serbian corner debutant. He is one of the first NBA play-by-play -play guys in Serbia from like 25 years ago, but has pivoted into more serious waters after he moved to Washington, D.C. some 20 years ago, where he covers various topics for Voice of America in the news agency that provides information for the viewers in former Yugoslavia. He still finds way to stay connected to the NBA, so he has done a lot of interviews with Nikola Jokic, Ognjen Stojakovic, but also Bogdan Bogdanovic, Nikola Vucevic, and so on. He was on my wish list for years, and we finally found a good Saturday for him, since he is just like Coach Michael Malone, a volleyball dad, so his weekends usually have road trips on the docket. Welcome, my fellow Partizan Belgrade fan, Brata Zorjevic. Hi, Miroslav, and thank you for having me, and uh, hi to everyone who listens. So before we dive into, into the theme of, of, of the day, I just wanted to ask you, Partizan landed Nuggets favorite PJ Dozier and also Frank the Tank Kaminski, who is well known in Serbia because of his Serbian descent. Does it seem to you that Coach Obradovic is determined to, wish, to win his 10th EuroLeague with the same team he won it his first, like, 31 years ago? Uh, funny that you mentioned that, because I, I think I've been talking about that since he came back. And I, I, I firmly believe that the idea is, like, the number 10 should be won with the same team as number one. And... And I was delighted to hear about PJ and 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 Frank Kaminsky coming to Partizan. I, I think uh, last year they uh, they didn't have enough uh, 
luck, let's say, with all that, that with the fight in Madrid that kind of uh, destroyed their chances to to win that uh, uh, matchup and go to Final Four. And and eventually we know that Real won the Final Four. So, I mean, all all of us who support Partizan kind of were left questioning what would have been if you are up to zero and and nobody's you know ejected and you have all players i'm sure that i mean there is no doubt in my mind that series ends differently and partisan goes to final four and who knows you know who would bet against jacob radovich in final four like i i always kid about partisan and red star belgrade fans that we are like lakers and boston fans because we won all the local trophies throughout you know the the serbian history but on the other hand, if you if you scale it up to the to the Euroleague level, then we are talking about you know real underdogs. So how huge of a story was it back in '92? I know you were you were already active uh, uh, covering covering basketball back then uh, for for Partizan Belgrade team that was like 22 years on average old team to to oh, yeah. the Euroleague. Well, well, it was still like a few years before I started uh, uh, doing sports journalism back in, in, in former Yugoslavia. It was like two or three years away from that. I started in 9 to 5. But uh, I was like crazy that season. I was I was watching that season and and I believed from the get-go, right? Because Georgievich, Danilovic, they were the best uh, uh, best Point guard shooting guard combo in the in the in the Euro League, and Jacob said that from the get go, and he was like this young coach, and everybody was like laughing, right? Like, what is he talking about? And but they just grew so much during that season, and and everything kind of got together at at the end. I mean, the bad thing about all that is like that then there were three years of sanctions and. Former Yugoslavia team couldn't play in the Olympics in Barcelona, and then European Championship, World Championship that should have been in Belgrade. So that was the bad thing about it. But but that '92 was like magical season. Like they were not even 22. I think like 21 point something, right? Something like that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We're gonna have to make a special episode only on that. Oh my because god! Because we have a lot of stuff on our docket for today. So let's start with the star of today's show, Aaron Gordon. So Bratza, how big do you think his visit to Sombor is? I don't know if you had similar experiences with your colleagues from the US coming to Belgrade to see where you are from, but I would imagine that would be mean a lot to you. So uh, I think it's huge. I mean, even the him coming last season, last summer to, to European Championship was huge. But this kind of raises it to a different level, I think. And and it just uh, shows that uh, team bonding thing that Denver has going on. And and that's one of the one of the probably things that that led them to this uh, win this past season and and this playoffs that that actually seemed like so easy that people think like oh the opponents were not good enough right so uh i personally didn't have uh a situation where a colleague would come to visit me in belgrade and see when i was there but like long time ago one of my colleagues from dc when i was uh, going to many uh wizards games and and he was the local uh beat writer i think he's in athletic now michael lee he told me that he's planning a trip to belgrade right so i gave him some pointers where to go where to eat where what to do right and and then he came like with so many uh positive uh experiences uh, he went to a restaurant that i told him to go eat sarma he started like pickling uh, uh cabbage uh, in in winter to make sarum at his home and uh, and even today like like when we meet we don't see that each other that often but occasionally at games he would come to Wizards I think he's based in Philly now so so we would still talk about that trip to Belgrade when he uh, met I think Martin Sedlicek was guiding him through the through Belgrade and it was like probably 15 years ago or more. It must have been more because because I, I had more time going to the games and uh, that was probably before my daughters were born. 
and uh, and we had this experience this uh, past summer. We just came from Belgrade like uh, 12 days ago, and uh, the last four days in Belgrade, my my older daughter was joined by her uh, a friend from school and club. She they played together volleyball on the school team, on a high school varsity team, and uh, and in a club. So she came just for four days. It was crazy. We put them in a different apartment, but but it's like. I know that my daughter appreciated so much, right? And I'm sure that Nicola was ecstatic about uh, Aaron coming there. And and we saw the photos and videos and and you know Aaron holding that trophy and all that. Like it's just amazing. Yeah, and the underrated thing about it is the fact that you know NBA players don't know much about each other. I mean the 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 guys that play on the same team. Yeah. If you ask them like like what's the capital of Serbia or what's the capital of Slovenia or something like that, you know, just to show appreciation of of their colleague, it's not a common thing for everybody to know everybody about each other, you know, just to so so when you see this kind of bond uh, on, yeah. on this high of a level uh, in 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 the NBA is, is really great. So tell me about Aaron Gordon when he signed. For the Nuggets, uh, when was it? Like three, three seasons ago, at the at the yeah. end of uh, after the uh, on the trade deadline, so he came to Belgrade for Gary Harris's uh, bad contract, R.J. Hampton, and a twenty who is by the way out of the league right now, and a twenty twenty five first round pick that might end up being like the thirtieth pick, the way the things are going right now. So, how high were you on? on him when he came and then nine games later when they won er against everybody and crushed every every opposition and then in two other spots like during the the purgatory the two seasons when the nuggets didn't have their guys and now that they're champions how would you to make that that you know uh scatter line of aaron gordon well first of all when he when i found out that he's coming uh my first thought was like, okay, this is the missing piece. They're going to win a championship now, right? And then those first nine games were like, I was like, yeah, that's what I meant, right? And then and then Murray gets injured. And you're like, oh, man, this is probably, you know, delaying this for at least an extra year. This year is going to be hard, but the next one, he's probably not coming back unless he comes back, right? But even if he comes back, if he had come back, it would have been the same Murray as, as we know, it, right? It took like two, basically almost two seasons for him to come back to, you know, where he was. But but Aaron, I mean, I've always been uh, a big fan of Aaron. Like when he was in Orlando, I remember a couple of times uh, at the All-Star game, he got robbed of that slam dunk competition, like, like, I was I can believe right and but I always thought like he was a better player that he could have showed up in the Orlando in Orlando's jersey just by the fact that that he he was asked to be the main guy right and and I felt like in Denver he's not going to be asked to do all that and he's going to be able to do a lot more and cover all these uh missing kind of pieces in every part of the game, right? And then um, uh, I think just like the the connection with Nicola happened and, and that's what I think changed his way of basketball thinking. And I think he said that in the interviews many times that he just figured out a way how to play basketball the right way. And And I mean, I'm not really surprised by what he showed us last season or this season frankly i think he should have been on the all-star team and um i mean i think with him he he still has space to improve like like there is there is there is space and 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 this whole team they're they're definitely going to improve and uh you know now i look at what happened during the summer and people are some some people are probably going to be like oh Denver lost Brown and Denver lost this and what's that but this is a scary good team and and scary young team for for like as championship teams go 
Yeah, I just wanted to to list off a couple of uh, or the five best games of of Aaron Gordon this season, so regular season and playoffs. And if you if you take a look at that, his fifth best game was on November twenty third at OKC, the game with no Jamal and no MPJ. He scored thirty one points, eight rebounds, four assists, two blocks, four or five beyond the arc. Then. On February 9th in Orlando, without Jamal, 37 points, 13 rebounds, 15 of 21 from the field. That sounds like Nikola Jokic. He was plus five in the 11-point loss, actually, in Orlando. And now the three games from, from this year's uh, playoffs. First, game one of the second round versus Phoenix, 39 minutes, 23 points, six rebounds, three of four from three beyond the arc, plus 25 then game four of the Western Conference Finals, 22 points, four, six rebounds, five assists, two blocks, three or five from beyond the arc, plus 10 in a two-point win. And then finally, game four of the NBA Finals against Miami, 27 points, seven rebounds, six assists, three or four from beyond the arc, team high, 29. What I wanted to say about this is Aaron Gordon is, is more than a, than a really, really good uh, um, role player. He is a guy that could have been uh, one of the main guys on a lesser team, but he he uh, he decided to be part of this Denver core, and of course, he signed that extension to make sure he's he he would be here for a long time. So, kudos to Aaron Gordon, and we'll take a short break before we continue our talk. Okay, we are back for the second segment. Braca, can you describe what is doing play-by-play -play commentary for the NBA in the middle of the night look like in, in Serbia? Or at least what it looked like back in the day when you did it? Oh my God, that's like a different life. Like I think that I came here 20 years ago. It's going to be 20 years in October. So I probably did one of my last games back in like May 2003. Well, I did a couple during the All-Star weekend in 2004 and 5 as a but I was more like a color commentator than a play-by-play. -play. So, um yeah, it was it was awesome. It was the best job, you know. And uh and especially like that was like a second wave. We we had a first wave during those years when um when uh Bulls were in their second three peat, and that was done that was done on the other TV stations. I came at TV station. I came to B92 in 2000, just before the October 5th, 5th of October changes, democratic revolution and everything. And then we it was my colleague Ilya and, and I we were doing it. He he was doing way more. I was I was doing more sports and then uh I was uh doing play by play for some games but it was uh, it was just this one small room in the tv it's like a really small studio with a with a with a the tv screen and and we would get the feed with the us commentators and we would prepare from internet was still like not that big at the time but you know we would use you know yahoo sports or uh ESPN to get the game notes and um, get our all facts straight before the the games would come and and then uh, that was the time when the Kings with Page and Vladi were like really big and and we we broadcasted like a ton of their games we we did broadcast the others and I think at one point uh, that famous uh, Western Conference Finals in 2002 Ilya went there. But we couldn't do the broadcast from there, so I did the play-by-play. -play. So one of the games, probably the one that I will remember for the whole of my life, is that uh, that fifth game, well, fourth game, right, when Robert Ory 
hit that three pointer, and I was the play by play, and I was all alone. There was there was no color commentator, so it was me. And I remember him hitting that three. I just stopped talking. I didn't talk for a minute or something. And people were basically at the time there was like a big uh, video uh, beam on uh, on the main square in Belgrade. People would come and and gather and watch the games at four thir- start four thirty in the morning because Sacramento is like nine hours. So it was crazy the popularity of that team and and uh, the, the the number of comments that we would get emails and stuff like that. It was it was so much fun. So now fun. you you mentioned Vlade and Peja and Peja was a really big piece of that team. He was an all star while playing in, in Sacramento for three times. But Vlade was a living legend. He was already at the back end of his NBA career and basketball career in general. Can you tell me when you see pe- how people are passionate about Nikola Jokic, both ways, good and bad? You know, when they have good things to, to say about him, they will do it passionately, also bad things as well. But can you explain a bit how the Serbs followed our first NBA legend, Vlade Divac, wherever he went in, in America? Well, yeah, it's I, I see a lot of similarities, actually. And and I felt like always that, that Nikola was like a, a Vlade 2.0, new and improved version, right? And... Uh, and and I'm puzzled by like when when they start comparing Nikola to previous people who previously played similar to him at that position. For me, Vlade is the obvious choice. It's not Sabonis; it's Vlade. They're from the same country, and and if you look at their careers, Vlade had a better career than Arvidas in the NBA, and Vlade had like you know a lot of triple doubles. He was basically a point guard in the post for the Kings for all those four or five years. And he was like sort of a, like a glue guy on that team. And uh, even with the Lakers at the beginning, he was like, you you could say that he's like, we had him and Drajan and Paspal come the same year. But Vlade was the one who was put in right away. He was the sixth man. He was coming in for Clay Thompson's dad, who was the starter that year. And uh and he's the guy who actually in the second season when they were able to get to the finals, I feel like he was the best player on that Lakers team, like in that final series. I mean, of course, they lost to Bulls and it was – but it didn't look that way when they won that first match, right? <laughs> yeah. So um, so I feel like uh, Vlade and Nikola have a lot of similarities and also the, the fact that they were always – there was always questions, is Vladi going to play for the national team? Is Vladi going to play for them? I mean, that went with Peja too and went with uh, others like Krstic. There were always players who were never in doubt. Like, you know, Bogdan, if he's healthy, you don't even have to ask. He's he's there. He's on the list. Uh, but uh, the times changed. So, so I feel like... Uh, People are mad at Nikola for not playing this year, but he played a hundred games. It was a it's a different basketball than than it used to be back in you know 80s or 90s. They played too many games and they have to have rest. Like look at Murray is not gonna play, Yanis is not gonna play. We we're gonna get deeper into that in, in yeah. segment three, but before that, I wanted to ask you. So Vlad, one one thing that's underappreciated about him he played for 16 seasons in the nba and appeared in the playoffs for 14 times yeah and he was a big part of all of those teams so that's something you cannot say about somebody who is not an all all time great player oh my god so so vlade vlade was really really so if you think about him and other great european players who would you pick to be the one that that uh, made the most influence for the NBA to look like like it looks like today with all the great superstars from Europe. Who were the guys that paved the way for for all the superstars of today? So I mean, I'm not gonna be a hundred percent. I'm gonna be hundred percent biased here, and I'm gonna say Vlade because he is the first guy, and and I. 
I feel like if there is one guy that you have to point out to, he's the first one that that made it look possible to for Europeans to play here. I mean, Drajan came with him. He didn't have a great situation in Portland, but then when he moved to New Jersey, he was definitely the guy who showed us that not only you can be like a really good player on a good team like Vlade was with Magic on the Lakers, but you had Drajan who was the main guy on a playoff team, ended up being a third team all star or, or third team all NBA. Uh, who who knows what would have happened if if he didn't awesome. die in a car accident? He, he was amazing. Uh, I mean, then you have Kukoc come. Raja was like at one point the best player on the Boston Celtics. Granted, not the best Boston Celtics team, but he was still like a double double average guy. Like Vlade had a year in Lakers when he was averaging 16 and 10, I think, or 11. And uh, and funny when you mentioned like two years that he missed playoffs was with the Lakers. It was not with the Kings or the Charlotte, right? Yes, so, exactly. Yeah, and and I mean one of the years is like. That he missed it is like he was injured almost the whole season right and it's i'm also that that here is like i felt like he was gonna do really well with kobe and and it's a bummer that he wasn't able to play but then you go from all of them building a little bit like step by step right i think uh the first really people who showed us that we might have superstars like today like Yanis, Luca or Nicola are I think it started with Tony Parker and Manu Ginobili right so so it has to be them and maybe Paul Gasol right yeah it's actually a conveyor belt of, of great players you had Vlade you had Trajan you have Tony and and uh and Dino and then after them you you got Peja and Dirk and yeah. Tony and Paul Gasol and and, and now you have this practically third generation and honestly it's the first time that we can we can talk about having like three out of top five guys yes, players uh, to be to all of them be be from from europe which is which is pretty cool for the fans mm -hmm. from our side and i think it's 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 pretty pretty cool for the nba fans worldwide to see the the league grow in that way yeah and in a way when you look at uh, nicola and luca who are like Serb and Slovenian, they would fit right in into that old Yugoslavia teams with Vlade, Peja, Dra Vlade, Drajan, Tony, and Dino, right? Like the ones before the breakup of Yugoslavia. Like they look like the players that Yugoslavia would have at that time. Yes. Okay, we'll take another short break and then we'll return. Okay, third segment, time for some hard talk. So what was your first thought when you heard Nicola would skip this year's World Cup? And tell me, does it does living in the States for a long time makes your response more or less emotional? Uh, thank God for me living in the States because it makes it way less emotional, <laughs> way less. Like that's, that helped me with partisan losses and bad times and Serbia losing, being here kind of makes it really, really less emotional. And uh, my first thought was like, I was, uh, I felt, you know, uh, I would have loved to see him, but I also understand completely what he has been through. Like in the last two, three, four seasons, last year was, you know, the year when he did play for the national team, it didn't end the way we wanted to. And I get this is the World Cup, but the problem is like the next year is the Olympics. So what happens? He plays this year. Does he play next year? Is, isn't is the Olympics the pinnacle? This this could be easily the last Olympics he's going to try to play in, or maybe one more. But, you know, I'm sure that he will be available next summer. Yeah, let's let's just hope for the for the Serbia to be able to to qualify for the Olympics, so we so we can assemble the 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 big team, the big team yeah. again. So, do you think there's a reason so many of our best guys, and not only our best guys, but other great players, NBA players, worldwide, 
that are, they are not playing for national teams at the World Cup, or do you think it's just accidental for it to happen this year in particular? Well, this this year, I mean, I don't think that this year is any different than the other years. You know, one one year you're going to have some people skip it on one team, some people on another. I always talk to people when, when I talk to people in Serbia, and they get really, you know, um, fired up about this, and they say like, "But Gasol never missed the championship." I was like, "What are you talking about? Like you you're forgetting things. Like Tony Parker missed, Dirk missed some big championship." It's simply not possible for you to, you know, go to all those like like going back to what we said about the '90s, like when when Yugoslavia, the the second Yugoslavia was uh, under sanctions, it was great for those players that they didn't have uh, uh, the summer obligations. I think it prolonged their career, right? Even before the technology and recovery and all that that we have today helped them. But but the, the the what you're asking from your body is really crazy, right? So in a way, I feel. Uh, uh, what was what were we talking about? I'm just blocked right now. It's just that so many of the best NBA oh, yeah. players are, are missing the, the yeah, yeah. and I mean, I, I is it is it just the rest is, uh, stuff? A lot of that is on on FIBA's. Uh, you know, FIBA is a big culprit in all this because, uh, like all this, I mean, I'm not, I'm not gonna go into that, but, but these windows or whatever they're called, and you know, having teams like Slovenia, European champion, not qualifying for the next one because the stupid windows. I mean, that's we just gotta figure out a bit better way to have those players available and not have like. Not everyone has a, an option like United States or I don't know some maybe other country, but I don't I can't remember any other that that can send like the fifth best team and still win their qualifier. In Europe, it's really hard. Like even the the teams that we used to think like you know Great Britain or Belgium or whatever, it used to be like oh we can send like our u19 team that's not the case anymore everybody has good teams and and you gotta really uh think thinking through how you're gonna make it through the qualities to get to the big championships it, it, and most of the european teams it's like you it's easier for you to play at the at the main event than to qualify to you know the easier competition in a way exactly you have a, a for instance croatia so Croatia is a is a great basketball nation. You will always have a plethora of NBA players from Croatia, but when you force them to play those qualification games uh, in the middle of the season, when they cannot have their guys from NBA, when you cannot have their guys from Euroleague, and we are talking about a small nation of like four million people, yeah. you just don't have the players to play with, and then you have them missing this and that and for instance this world cup they will not be playing at even though they would have a pretty good team if they could yeah. so do you think there's a way for fiba to attract the best nba players to play in their tournaments today or at least the best nba players outside of nba because i don't know if you can you know make lebron james play again for the national team yeah. at the age 38. so adam mares gave us his idea a couple of days ago of Saudis buying the FIBA and making the tournaments more lucrative money-wise. <laughs> what what do you think? Is this like if you if you would give guys money for gold medals, would that maybe attract more more top level talent? I don't know, maybe, but but I would I would think that it's probably more about the number of games you're gonna have during the season, right? So if you're going to play in the NBA, have 82 regular season games and maybe 20, 25 playoffs games, and now you, we have this NBA Cup, right? So, uh, so is this something really feasible for people to play? Like they would have to skip. You, you remember, like when we were during the 80s, 90s, the the preparations for these competitions would be crazy. They would 
finish the season maybe sometime in May, the preps would start maybe a week or two later. And then the, 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 the Euro baskets were actually held in June, July, not even August, September, right? So they would go to the mountains and get ready and it would last like weeks. And now the training camps are way shorter, right? I feel like the main thing in getting the best players to play in these tournaments, because they all want to play in the Olympics, that there is no doubt about it. But Euros or World Cups are the question. And to do that is either like like probably the best thing would be to shorten the playing season, right? Like I don't know, NBA probably doesn't want to do that, but maybe maybe shorten a quarter instead of like twelve minutes, put it to ten, like yearly. Maybe that's like especially in the regular season, you know. So I feel like at the end of the day, whatever we try, it's gonna be about the number of games in the season. And if that stays the same way, I think it's hard to expect these guys to be ready to play for any you know, not really Olympic event. <laughs> they would need a lot of money. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> money or or for some of them, money is not even that important, right? So it's 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 different. I feel like in Serbia, like national team is a really important thing. I, I don't think U.S. national team, they, they, they want them to do well, but I think like living here 20 years, I would compare – the way Serbian people feel about national team, I would compare it to how Americans feel about their college teams, right? That's where their their allegiance lies, right? Like that's where we see these crazy uh, big groups of people go and root for their team and want everything great. It's not like, yeah, national team, of course. And, and I don't know, uh, you'll have big groups in volleyball national team, basketball national team, but in younger ages, it's probably going to be mostly parents or, you know, <laughs> uh, maybe some friends. It's it's nowhere near like the college situation in the US. Yeah. Okay. I want to tease our fourth segment with one question. So I have to ask you, you tweeted a photo of you and Michael Malone some six <laughs> weeks ago yeah. from a volleyball tournament. You are both volleyball dads, so naturally you will bond because of that. Did you talk to Coach Malone before the volleyball meets? And tell me if he is as intense while watching volleyball, you know, in a similar way to when he is coaching. So it was totally accidental, I must say. Like I was, it was like the beginning of the national championship uh, for girls in Chicago, and my older daughter was getting ready to do her to play her first match, and it was like first morning, and and my wife comes up to me and says, uh, "That guy awfully looks like Denver coach," and I was like, "Well, that's that's because that's Denver's coach." So I walk up to him and I met him a couple of times, and it was always when Nicola was. Uh, in dc and we would hang out in the hotel or or something like that and uh and then i of course i had to remind him who who i was but uh we didn't have a lot to talk like a lot of time to talk he was rushing to, to watch his daughter and then i found out she was i think she played for colorado juniors or, or something and uh and my my daughter knew who she was and uh, i haven't seen him after that like he went his way, I went my way. It was just a really pleasant photo, and I I knew it was gonna blow blow out, blown out, be blown out, and uh, and um, and and he was great. We talked a little bit, and he said like my daughter plays, and uh, I just told him like it was an awesome season, and you guys look, made it look so easy, and and he laughed. <laughs> so, but yeah. We have that bond in common. Probably next time when they come to DC, if I see him, we can talk a little bit more about volleyball. <laughs> yeah. Excellent. Okay, time for us last break, and then we'll do some more coaching talk. Okay, we're back. So our American friends have noticed how much we guys from former Yugoslavia like it when a coach like coach malone has a strong grip on the team and that can be said about many nba coaches how would you explain why we admire 
great coaches so much? That is such a tough question. <laughs> I mean, I uh, I mean, it's a good question, and and I'm trying to to think about it. I mean, I think growing up here, we were always taught about coaches being almost like gods. I remember when my older started playing ball, I was talking to her coach, and it was like a 12 and under coach, and I said, like, in our country, coach is God, and he said, like, but no. I mean, coaches cannot be gods because we all make mistakes. We're all, you know, human. We make mistakes and we should not be treated as gods. But in a way, like, I think it's just like we're brought up that way. And we were always taught that these great teams wouldn't be those great teams without great coaches. And uh, and that's always like something that, seem different than in the NBA. As you said, there are not many coaches that will be maybe Greg Popovich, right? Greg or, I don't know, Phil Jackson or, you know, I'm not sure. I mean, even it's it's a really, I think, a background question. Like, how did we grow up? Because we grew up with, uh, I mean, I... Uh, who, who were our, like, be, even before Jake, we had, uh, you know, coaches that were uh, really great coaches in former Yugoslavia. It started with, you know, Atsanik, which was the legendary professor who also had uh, his uh, influence in that 1992 partisan team that we were, and and probably huge influence on Jake, who's has got to be the best coach in the history of European basketball right now. If we go by trophies and I mean, in general. So, uh, yeah, I would have to say the way we grew up and and having all those great coaches uh, do great things like Malkovich or uh, even, you know, Novosel or uh, uh, Dushku Yoshevich for, for all it's worth, like you know um people who would be able to do more more with less like like they like to stay here right? i think i think we're lucky in denver to have a group of players with, with without big egos so we don't have a hardened situation on the nuggets we don't have a ben simon situation on the nuggets we don't have even even damien lillard wanting to go out you have a coach that's coaching some really great superstar level players or or star level players that are all willing all willing to 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 be under under his wing and that that's actually something that it's almost guaranteed to 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 give you some kind of results so let's now people start with the with your superstar right yeah i agree and i agree at the end of the day you have like four players on that team or five or six players who could be the best player any given game and they don't care if they're going to be and that's the most important and i feel like former yugoslavia teams played that way yeah yeah i agree i agree with that let's let's now pivot to nikola jokic who finally got recognized universally as the best player in the world you have a unique perspective of a guy from belgrade that has lived almost half of his life in the us why do you think the national media and frankly even parts of local media in Denver were so slow to adopt the fact that there is a generational player on the Nuggets? I mean, it's still a puzzle for me. Like I I have no idea how can people who follow basketball, who have been following it for years and who have been watching it, and I mean I can't fathom that they couldn't realize what he was like his first year was like 2015 16 right and i remember him coming to dc and i saw him he was he was already playing quite a bit he was coming off the bench that first match in dc he was like uh i, I want to say he had a double double easily Maybe maybe Nurkic was injured. I don't remember. He was. He was. Yeah. The first time. And then and then we. He came. He came. We. I saw him in the locker room, and and 
and I was like, great game. And somebody else told him, great game. And he was like, it was not a great game. I had two turnovers, three turnovers in the, in the, in, at the end. And I was like, and I was trying to be like, you know, this experienced guy who watches NBA for a long time. I was like, you know, tomorrow you're going to have a next game. Nobody cares, cares. And you could see how much he cares, right? And he had a great game for a 20-year-old guy. Uh, they lost, you know, at the end. But but I wouldn't, if I was in his shoes, I would not be bothered by that. He was bothered. And, and I remember telling people that story when I figured out, like, this guy is going to be really good. I thought, I thought he's going to be an all-star. I mean, I'm not going to say I thought he was going to be like this because I, that would be bullshit because, you know, nobody could have said that he was going to be this. But, but the steps that he took from the first year, second, third, like there is no year when he didn't improve. Like you rarely see that. And, and especially like I felt like a lot of times during these years that I've been following NBA, there were players who would sign a big contract and then – Thing would start. Take it easy. Yeah. Yes, take it easy. And he was never that guy. And I mean, I'm. I can't answer your question because for me, it's a it's a mystery. It's a mystery. <laughs> you know, I'm not gonna go. You know, Kendrick Perkins way or whatever. But this is, I mean, for me, complete mystery. And I hope this is over now. But I don't know. Maybe it's not. Who knows? It's so funny because, you know, the Nuggets didn't have a lot of national TV games before. Yeah. And then there's this, you know, time zone difference because, yeah. like, most people in America live in the East Coast and it's too late for them to watch games that are playing in Denver. So even if there is a <laughs> there is a game national, national TV, TV game, nobody's watching it because, because it's yeah. too late. We had this, this crazy quote from Lisa Salters who is a, oh, one of the God. most famous most famous <laughs> reporters uh, on the national level in the NBA who said that she actually never saw Nikola Jokic play before this playoff run which is which is just crazy unbelievable right unbelievable and we were talking before like i i've been wearing denver shirts and jerseys and everything here in DC, nobody kind of noticed. Like last year, it just went crazy. Like whenever I would go and I had a Denver shirt, there would be like five people yelling, like, go Nuggets, go Nuggets, go. Like it just like, I I can't believe that TV still has that much uh, kind of influence with all the social media, all the stuff that you can see on Instagram Reels, on YouTube, you know, everywhere. Like re you read articles, you will see a ton of video, right? And uh, but I guess you know it's uh, as you said when you mentioned the ESPN reporter. Like, man, I I don't know. I just hope it's over. I hope so, we are at the point where they will not do that anymore. <laughs> they have no other option. Yeah. They, they just need to honor the, the NBA champion. So you've talked to Nikola many times. I mean, he, almost every time he comes to, to Washington to play the Wizards. So can you tell me if there is some change in, in his demeanor from when he first came to, to America comparing to today? I mean, from your, you know, from talking to you, of course. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I mean, the short answer would be no, and the long answer would probably tell me no. <laughs> no, he's the same guy. He's he he's like in a in a way he's very funny. He's very approachable. He's very nice. Very well mannered. He never. I, I mean, frankly, I think over the years his behavior has become better and better if it's possible, like his game, right? And uh, he looks more uh, confident, for sure. But he's still the same guy. I think uh, all this stuff that, uh, I think for years, uh, we were having these stories about him not caring about the trophies, not caring about his statistics. And, and, and people thought like maybe it was, 
not true. Maybe it's fake, right? I remember uh, after the first year when he uh, won the MVP, he they were in D.C., and it was just after COVID, so we didn't see each other in the gym, in the arena, but we saw each other at the at the hotel. And we were talking, and he was, like, saying that they are moving from their downtown apartment and that he doesn't know where the trophy is. And that story, I think, came out later in the media, but I heard it before and, and never said anything about it. But but later it came out in the media, so I can I can say it now. But uh, but it just like shows you like like look at the photo when they won um, when they won the championship. There is a team photo. He's with the with his daughter in the corner, and then his MVP trophy is like I think Michael holds it, right? Coach Malone holds it. Like you never see that stuff. And then he came to that interview with uh, Valika Andrews, and she said, "Like I've done done a ton of this, and I've never seen anyone come without the trophy, the MVP." <laughs> so it just shows you, like he's a real, like he's really what we see and what we think he is, right? And I've I've witnessed that up close and personal, and in, in all these years seeing him here and and one time i i was in denver five years ago to do a when i was doing a story about four of serbian players and 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 he was the same he's the same guy yeah we need to to get you back to denver and and visit dnvr bar because there's yeah. plenty of stories you, you can share yeah, with the guys there sure. as well sure. one last question so last season he was the mvp favorite up until like a month before the end of the season. And then Kendrick Perkins came with the whole mess about the race and, and stuff like that. Do you believe that Nikola after that punted on, on the MVP trophy on purpose? Or is was it just coincidental that the Nuggets were just that good and he couldn't he could like take a take a, a lower gear to the end of the season? I think it's probably like I wouldn't say that he would do that on purpose. Uh, I think it just fit into the whole idea of them uh, thinking about the playoffs and getting ready for that, and not thinking about the. I mean, he never cared about that trophy anyway. We we all all of us others cared much more, and and I think uh, uh, I was not worried about. Uh, the losing streak or whatever, I I I felt like I I had confidence in Coach Malone what he was doing, and I, I thought it was a great way to get ready. And I was not surprised at all by the way they played in the playoffs. Uh, I expected some other opponents on the way to the championship, but you know you can only play a team in front of you. And uh, at the end of the day, I felt bad that he didn't get the third MVP that he definitely deserved. And it was a stupid reason. Uh, but on the other hand, like, like compare him, like he didn't get it because LeBron and Michael didn't get it, right? So that's a, I'm always a guy who looks at the glass half full. That's a really good company. Like Bill yeah. Russell and Larry Bird and uh, who's the third guy? Uh that's uh, a really Tem Chamberlain, good, yeah. Yeah, so that's a really good company. But I take Michael and LeBron over that company. Or Michael LeBron, and people will say Yanis, but it's different. Yanis Nicola deserved that one. So Yanis didn't deserve that third one. This one Nicola deserved, but you know. <laughs> it's funny, so many people said we don't want to give him the third consecutive because only few uh, greatest players ever did it. But then in 10, 20 years, we'll probably say, oh man, I cannot believe we didn't give it, give it to him. Yeah. He was so deserving, one yeah. of the greatest players of all time. Yes. But what are you going to do? Okay, this was super fun. I'm glad we finally made this episode happen. Yeah, me promise, me, promise me you'll return next summer so we can properly oh, celebrate yeah. the Nuggets I, repeat. I'm available. Whenever you need me, I'm available unless it's a boyable season. And that <laughs> Like you know, uh, pretty much you know, <laughs> January to <through> July. <laughs> yeah, yeah, excellent. So summer should be fine. So summer that's should. all for today, folks. Have a great weekend and enjoy the last month of summer. Cold months are approaching. 
unless you live in the southern hemisphere in which case you are in for a nice surprise yeah I, I don't know how to follow up on that well i guess i'll see you again next saturday on another edition of serbian corner